Okay, welcome everyone. Um, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to tune into our webinar. Um, I'll, um, I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So today um, I'll be discussing um, feral pigs and the seasonal impacts, uh, which looks at what pigs are costing our region in real dollar figures. Uh, we also have Justine McNally, District Veterinarian for Moree, uh, giving a presentation uh, on um, how feral pigs affect livestock production. And we have also have Emma Sawyer, who uh, works with New South Wales DPI in the training and coordination role to help people use feral skin in New South Wales. And that's for monitoring pest animals and as a communication tool. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few people with a few uh, questions uh, as we go along. So on that information panel on the side of the, your screen, there's a, a drop down box. If you could please use as a chat uh, box, it'll just um, uh, makes it a little bit easier to, um, to follow through that channel. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so if you, if you just use that chat section, it'd be the, the best if that's all right. So I'll get along with it. Um, uh, my presentation, uh, so my name's David Lindsay, uh, Senior Biosecurity Officer with the Northwest Local Land Services. I've been in this job for just short of 29 years. So I've had a fair bit of experience with a lot of different um, um, control options and, and, and with feral, pig, feral pigs over the time. But one of the problems I've encountered uh, when trying to emphasise the extent of feral pig damage is that very few landholders have taken the time to put a dollar figure on the damage that the pigs have caused. Uh, so what, what did I see as the problem? And well, obviously, and most people are pretty aware of it, that feral pigs are breeding themselves back into a significant numbers. Um, we're getting lots of reports all the time about just how many pigs people are starting to see around the area. We did have a situation during the drought, um, which isn't that long ago, where the, um, the numbers of pigs reduced quite considerably. And that was all due a lot to, to small litters, um, obviously with, with the lack of protein uh, and, and food source, the, the fertility of the pigs was, was not quite as high, so their litters were smaller. Um, they also had a poor survival rate, so those little pigs um, didn't have a great lot of feed once they were weaned. Um, I know there's plenty of cases where there was no water around on properties or, or only cattle tribes. And, and once the pigs were weaned, little fellas were weaned, um, they couldn't actually access the water. So um, they perished in, in that situation. Um, the other thing was they were easy targets. So obviously without any cover, um, predators had a pretty easy um, target to hit with those, with those smaller pigs. Uh, and of course, so did landholders, uh, no cover. They could see pigs from a long way away and, and, and a lot of them were, were able to be shot. But now we actually have probably a perfect season for feral pig breeding. Uh, they have plenty of food. Um, so their the protein levels are up. They've got all they want to eat. Um, there's plenty of water. They don't have to travel far from where their food is to actually access the water um, and plenty of cover. So in a lot of cases, people can't even see, you know, the pigs that are there. So we now have, you know, a situation where those sows are having large, um, large litters, um, well up to, you know, 10 piglets in a, in, a, in a litter. And with really exceptional food sources, they can actually have two litters in a year. So. Uh, so their, their chances of breeding are really high um, and yeah, the, everything's going perfectly for them. So this created a bit of a motivation. Uh, landholders, as I said, landholders were aware of the damage. They could see, you know, when they harvested, they could see the damage that was there. But in a lot of cases, they never really went to the trouble of putting that dollar figure on it. So we've actually 
decided we would try and come up with a way of, of, of getting a dollar figure that uh, everyone could actually see um, and, and utilise to their benefit in um, deciding on what they need to do with their feral pigs. Um, it also helped, if you've got that figure, to know how much you should be spending on your control. So if you know you're losing $100,000 and you can save half of that by, by um, you know, spending $20,000, you know it's well within your, you know, well, a, a, a great option to, to use. So the project, um, Northwest Local Land Services again partnered with um, Agicon, who um, did a great job. The, a, a couple of years back, we did a um, uh, quite a large project, which um, um, it um, um, was designed to to come up with a, a range of costs, uh, the losses that, that feral pigs uh, were causing on individual holdings. But there was a lot of variations within that, and and um, with those variations, it made it a little bit hard to come up with a an overall cost per per holding. So this time around, we've actually conducted uh, two landholder surveys, one in winter and one in summer. That's through 2020, and obviously winter was through 2021. We had 158 respondents over 500,000 hectares, um, and it was a really good spread. Um, it, it it really was a a, a great um, it covered pretty much all of the area that we needed to and a lot of the enterprises that were involved in our region. Um, but at the end of this um, presentation or at the end of the, the webinar, there will be a questionnaire that pops up. And one of the questions there is, is actually going to be, do you want to be part of the survey? So the more people that we can actually get to respond to these surveys, and we'll do another couple of surveys over the next two years, just to get a bit of a guide on to what's happening and, and, and how the, um, the costs are either rising or, or falling and, and um, we'll get a little bit more of a real-time analysis on that. So if you'd like to be part of the survey and the more people that we can get involved in the survey, the more accurate all the figures are gonna be um, when we start working that out. So, so please, if you if you're, would at all be uh, happy to, to I, I can send you a link um, if, if I've got your details there and, and who wants to be involved. Um, so yeah, so this information um, was able to be extended and it was very representative of our whole region. We had lots of different people from you know, lots of different enterprises and, and it covered pretty much everything we needed to. So it was, it was a really good survey. So the results, um, the regional commodity lost in the 12 month period, um, and that's, we're only talking just in the Northwest local land service area. So it doesn't go outside of that, um, but we're able to calculate that to be uh, pretty close to 132,000 tonnes of grain. Um, and obviously that you know, it, it works out to be a lot of money when you start putting those sort of figures on it. 15,000 bales of cotton, uh, 11,000 lambs. Um, that's quite considerable, really, and and, um, and obviously the total cost worked out to be more than forty-seven million dollars just in the northwest local land services area alone. So, in a breakdown, um, you can see there that every enterprise is, is pretty much listed down the side, or, or the main enterprises that that we find in our area. Um, obviously, there's a lot more things that are grown and a lot more stock that, that are involved, but these are the main enterprises and these are the ones that are probably mainly hit by the feral pigs as well. So you can see that um, the percentage of loss down here, that is only an average. So um, there'll be places that will lose in, for instance, with the barley, there'll be, lot, there'll be places that'll lose a lot more than 3.2% um, right across their holdings, but there will be places that will lose less than that. And that'll all be based on different things. One of those will be their pig numbers, um, obviously. Um, and the other is, you know, what control programs are in place and, and what they're doing to, to keep their pig numbers under control. Um, you'll also see that um, things like wheat, um, it has a really high representation. There's a lot more wheat grain in the area 
So therefore, you'll see that it's a lot, uh, you know, $20 million uh, lost in, in wheat production through pigs, even though it's really just, you know, middle of the ballpark figure for the percentage of, of uh, anticipated damage. So, um, yeah, just the fact that, you know, there's, still, there's 77 tonnes lost, but it's just because there was so much wheat grown. You'll also see that uh, things like cotton um, will have a very high cost per hectare. The reason why that high cost per hectare is in there is, is generally because cotton is such a high uh, value commodity. Uh, a little bit of damage can do quite a deal of uh, dollars per hectare. Um, so that's pretty much a breakdown. That's that's in the report that um, that Agicon have done, which you can find on our website. I'll give you some addresses at the end. But um, yeah, by all means, and, and this is not the only thing that's in there. There's quite a deal of information in there. So feel free to go in and have a look at that, um, and uh, and actually yeah, see what uh, how it's all broken down and how the, these figures were were organised and came to. Um, so what to do? Um, those pig numbers are continuing to increase. We've had, as I said, the season now is really good. And that information came from over 12 months ago in the in the summer crop um, and and obviously you know last year with the winter crop. The figures are for those crops, but what's going to happen in this year and what's happening right now with our summer crops? So um, it's it's really hard to to work out how much, you know, with the number of pigs increasing, just how bad that those figures could be. So we really need to be vigilant now. We need to be out there monitoring, we need to be seeing what's going on um, and, and really taking note of what's happening um, and, and acting on, on what you see. We've got to keep in, uh, in mind that if you don't take out 80% of a population of pigs on your holding, then you'll actually have more pigs next year than what you have now. So the damage is going to continue to increase. And 80 is the 80 percent is the critical number. So you need to be, you know, looking to try and get up around 90 percent control um, to start getting ahead of the pigs and trying to keep the numbers um, in some sort of a um, correction. So your control, to, to try and get that 80% or better, your control programs really have to be effective. So that just means that when you do a control program, you need to make sure you're actually out there and, and do it properly. You know, don't just do it half-hearted. Make sure if you're gonna do a, a baiting program that you do your free feeds appropriately and make sure you get the, you know, plenty of free feeds out to, to as many places as you can and, and you know, have plenty of op opportunities for the pigs to come across those free feed stations and, and then subsequently baiting stations. If you're going to do an aerial shoot, you know, do put enough time into it and make sure that you're actually getting the, the pigs that you need to get. Um, it also needs to be broad scale. So what we're sort of saying is you, you've got to try and, well, if you're going to run a program, talk to your neighbours, try and get them involved. The bigger the area that you can cover with any sort of control program, uh, it limits that reinfestation from, from outside of the area. Um, and then you're only faced with the, the pigs on your own holding breeding up. If you've got, if you only do your holding, then you've got you know, pigs that you haven't been able to control breeding, plus you've still got that reinfestation coming from around the area. So get, get as wide as you can, get as many people involved as possible. It also needs to be integrated. So don't just rely on one source. Um, there's there's a few ways to control feral pigs, and by using different things, um, you, you'll hopefully get a lot more. There'll always be pigs you can't shoot out of a helicopter because they learn to go to ground and, and hide. There's pigs that, that won't take 1080. There's pigs that become very trap shy. So not not any one uh, option is is the best. I think you've, you've really got to use a few options and, and work between them. So this is a bit of a, uh, a graph just showing you know how much uh, loss can be avoided by doing your feral pig control. So if you look along the bottom there that's uh, the percentage of pigs controlled and up the side uh, is 
the economic loss that can be avoided. So if you get right down the bottom here at 10%, if you only take out 10% of your pigs, you're actually going to find that your loss is going to continue to rise. Um, it's actually going to continue to get worse. If you're, if you're controlling 20%, you're really only just uh, staying right in the middle um, and, and not, not getting any benefit at all. But if you're up here around the 80%, which is what we're, what we're really aiming for at least, you know, you're getting a 63% benefit or just over 60% on this graph. Um, but ideally, you'd like to get up to 90%. It'd be very hard to get to 100%. And you'll see that 100% um, gets you over 80% um, economic loss avoided. I mean, there's always going to be economic loss in any crop, um, not always caused by feral pigs. So, um, and there is a cost to doing that. So um, that is all taken into account. So if, uh, if you got rid of 100% of the pigs on your property, it would still cost you a little bit up the top here before you got to your 100% uh, uh, avoided economic loss. So those figures there, um, it's just basically putting them back into the, the figures there. So obviously, um, um, if you've had an 80% um, control, uh, there's still going to be a $17 million loss throughout our area. If everyone, if every 80% of every pig in our area was controlled, we'd still have a $17 million loss. But we would have would have um, uh, had a, a, a benefit of over $30 million. So it's pretty um, pretty good figures to sort of show that we really need to be doing something. So control options, and I'm probably talking to a lot of people who have had plenty to do with uh, controlling pigs and, and maybe I'm speaking to the converted, but um, yeah, 1080 and aerial pig shooting are probably the main two. And the initial, Agicon report actually showed that you'll get very similar results out of using both of those techniques. Um, but the techniques are basically going to be used uh, when under different circumstances. So you have a situation where if you're going to be doing aerial shooting, it's really ideal for that in-crop situation where you've got a crop out there like the sorghum is right at the moment, there's seed setting uh, on those crops. It's pretty much impossible to get those pigs to come out of the crops. Uh, to eat some grain on the outside if you want to try and do a, uh, a trapping or baiting program. So once you're in the crops, area shooting is probably the only way you're going to be able to get in there and clean the, the pigs up. But there is a cost and, and aerial shooting can be quite expensive. The 1080 baiting, uh, it, it really works better in between those crop cycles. So uh, if you imagine once all of the sorghum has been harvested, the pigs are going to have uh, a quite a big drop in the, the grain that they've been eating. Um, they will still be looking for protein sources and if you put grain out in your free feed situation or in a trapping situation, they're going to be a lot easier to get them onto that grain. Um, particularly, you know, as you move in towards winter, um, the the protein needs goes higher as they get as it gets colder. And obviously if you if you look at trying to do something before chick planting where pigs can do quite a deal of damage, um, you know, that, that's an ideal time to try and get out there and, and, and clean them up. Um, there's also trapping, um, and it definitely has a role to play. Like I said, we, we need to be looking at integrated um, control programs, and, and trapping definitely has a role. If, if you've got pigs that you can't shoot from the air because they're either too small and in plenty of cover, or, or maybe because they're, um, uh, you know, not eating the, the 1080 grain, um, you may be able to use a trap to to um, to get on top of that. Um, but you do have to be aware that the trapping can be quite time consuming and you need to be really be persistent. Um, you need to be really working at it to, to have any sort of um, reasonable impact. So it's something to keep in mind if, you, if you're just relying on, on trapping. Uh, ground shooting and pig hunters, um, but they have limited success, um, but um, even with that limited success, they, they still have that role to play. And, and, you know, after you've done an aerial shoot, there's always going to be a few pigs around. And, and there's a time that, that pig hunters, or, or even if you just drive them around with a rifle, you're going to be able to shoot a few pigs and, and just, you know, assist with the overall control in that, in that situation. 
And of course, there are exclusion fencing, which, um, you know, it is a control option, but there's lots and lots of different exclusion fences. And it's, you know, it's nearly a whole subject in itself in, in, in how you go about that. Um, and the, my, the other thing is that there are also fact sheets. So there's fact sheets that will cover all of the, the control options um, that, uh, that we've had, how they, how they um, can actually save you money. And, and they're all done through that initial report with Agicon as well. So how can we help? Uh, we can supply 1080. Um, and at the moment, 1080 is free of charge. So if you want to do a 1080 baiting program, uh, all it's really going to cost you is your grain. Uh, we do have the specific chemical training. So you have to have a chemical user card, either a chem cert or, or some sort of card to use 1080. If you don't have those, we can actually do a training course that will cover 1080 very specifically. It doesn't cover anything else, but it will cover 1080. So we do those training courses. We do have a fast accredited tutor who can actually do um, um, private shoots uh, over if a group of people want to get together and use our shooter to, to be involved in that. Um, that option is available. So if you, if you think that's something you might be interested in, um, definitely contact us. Um, we do have traps as well for short-term loan. They're more for people to be able to have a look at, um, you know, what our trap designs are and hopefully, you know, develop your own, um, build your own traps and, and make improvements on, on the traps that we actually uh, have at the moment. And we also have plenty of advice. We have a pretty good team right across the Northwest Labor Land Services. Uh, we We've um, got quite a deal of experience between us all and, and we can give lots of advice on, you know, how you go about getting those, the pigs to eat your grain and, um, you know, how to how you best results from your trapping program, etc. And we can also assist in forming those groups. Um, there's nothing like peer pressure to get people involved in, in working in groups, but, you know, we can definitely help and, you know, we can, we can be involved in, in that whole group formation and, and keeping that group going into, into the future. So where do you find those resources? They're, they're the websites that I was talking about. Um, obviously the Northwest Local Land Services website is there. Um, and you can also get all of that information from the Agacon site as well. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone will get a recording of this at the end of, um, um, once, once we finish the webinar. So these, these uh, websites will be there for you if you want to um, um, come back in and, and have a look and, and go and have a look at those reports and, and um, um, fact sheets that are available there. So that's pretty much all I had to uh, talk about. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm sort of looking at the chat box there. I can't see any questions popping up there. If you, um, if you have any at all, by all means, um, um, put them in that chat box and we can, um, um, we'll get back to them a bit later on. Um, so what I will do now, I will actually um, change over and I will move across to Justine. Thanks, and she can do her presentation. I think you should be on there now, Justine. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint, Dave? I sure can. Good work, thank you. Okay, away you go. Rightio. Um, hi everyone, I'm Justine McNallin, I'm the District Vet at Moree. And um, I was asked by um, Dave to come and just give a little bit of um, a briefing on some of the impacts that feral pigs have on livestock. And so I thought the best thing to do is just to keep it um, fairly brief, as in not try and go into too many different subjects, because I think that just sort of um, makes it too confusing in the end. So I've basically just concentrated on um, a couple of things that I think are probably the most important areas uh, where feral pigs impact livestock production. So. Um, let me just see if this is, oh, yep, here we go. So I basically thought really there are direct and indirect um, impacts with feral pigs. And so the direct impacts are reproductive performance, um, 
mainly that is really seen in cattle um, through disease and in sheep through actual physical damage by the pigs. Um, reduced production performance, so you're just not getting the productivity out of your animals that you should be getting because of the impact of the pigs. And then that general damage and pollution of water and feed sources, which different um, seasons will see more damage and pollution of those sources than others. Uh, and we definitely saw that during the drought with um, a lot of um, pig activity around um, feeding areas for sheep and cattle. And then I thought there's another area which is indirect impacts that really do have an economic impact um, on producers and that's actually your own human health or that of your workers and brucellosis in dogs, especially with working dogs. And I mean, as in your Kelpies or cattle dogs that you actually use for work and for some people also pet dogs or, or pig dogs. So the main issues that I think are, are where they really impact is with the spread of leptospirosis, um, brucellosis and also predation. So we'll just move on from there and into leptospirosis. So lepto is a thing called a spirochete bacteria and spiro being because it's spiralled. And so I thought I'd put that little picture in and that's um, taken under an electron microscope. So, I mean, they're really tiny, but they are actually like corkscrews. And in Australia, there are quite a few different serovars and they're like variants, I suppose, or, or different types. But the, the main ones of concern for us are Leptospira hajo and Leptospira um, pomona. Now, the one thing is with the Lepto hajo is more a cattle type of um, cirrhiva and it's generally carried in them but pigs can carry them um, occasionally but it's a fairly low prevalence and in a few studies that have been conducted it's sort of down around four percent so they're, they're not a big harbour of harjo or spreader but the big one is Pomona and um, the feral pig is basically one of the main reservoirs of leptopomona and it's been known for years um, that it's about at a 50 percent um, prevalence rate in feral pigs so I mean there were studies conducted back in the 50s and 60s that were getting percentages like that and and they continue on um, today with you know studies that were done in the uh, around 2012 2013 that um, showed that so that that prevalence is what really drives the disease in cattle. So here I've just, I forgot I had it in that slide, but um, as you can see, uh, the latest study, which was in 2012, 2013, um, showed this prevalence of 53%. So there were a number of um, feral pigs that were caught and um, and bloods were taken from them, they were caught and killed. And, and the study was to look at, um, how many actually zero converted to um, lepto and 53% were to this Pomona. The big thing about lepto is it's pretty easily shed because it is a bacteria that colonizes in the reproductive tract and in the kidneys. So when an animal urinates or they give birth to young, there's bacteria all through that. So it, that's how the environment becomes contaminated. And so the big, the common things are urine, blood and birthing fluids or products. So it's been actually a huge issue in the dairy industry because, you know, the, the milking um, staff would be down in the, the pit and they'd be, you know, of course, getting urine on them from, um, from the cattle above in the, in the dairy. And so there, there was a lot of work done around um, lepto and it's spreading to dairy workers. And I think we sometimes forget because we're not in that situation that we're actually just as much risk. So you, that's the big source is urine. Um, the other thing too is it's a pretty um, resilient bacteria. So depending on the uh, environmental conditions, it can last for quite some time. So if it's stagnant water, it'll only last several weeks, but 
if you've got um, free flowing water, it can actually last for several months, which is quite significant. And even in saturated soil, you know, when the water sort of, it's just so heavy with water, the soil, it can last up to six months. And there's even um, cases where the, the lepto has, when we've had floodwaters, it, it actually comes up out of that sort of clay environment where it's been damp and, and gets back onto the surface water. So for us, this season is really probably a classic lepto season. And I think people do need to be quite aware of that. The other thing too is that infection's fairly easy because it's through ingestion um, or via abrasions in the skin, whether it be in cattle or humans, and um, and also through mucous membranes. So like if you had your mouth open and a whole lot of urine flew in there, that's one way you can get it, but not many people are gonna do that. But you know, there, there's always that potential, but it can also be through the ingestion of aerosol, which is basically, um, the, the bacteria sits so tiny when urine's voided, believe it or not, there are very microscopic particles of the urine as it splashes up and, and they can actually be ingested and, and infection can be caused that way. So it's a pretty robust um, bacteria and can get in um, into an animal fairly easily. So what's the big reproductive impact on cattle? I think most people would know this, it's abortion and you're getting abortion at sort of four months onwards. Um, and if they do go to term, many are either stillborn or they're weak calves and they'll, they'll die. Both Pomona and Hajo can cause abortions. So they're the two strains that uh, the vaccines um, cover because they're the most common. And I think the other big um, thing around this is ensuring that you actually get preg testing done um, in your cattle herd, so you've actually got some idea where you're standing with um, your joining rate, and that can start giving you an indication if you've got some problems, especially if you haven't been vaccinating. Um, but I would hope that most people sort of see the significance of, um, of vaccination. Um, the production impacts in cattle can be a few different things, but for Harjo, and I probably should have actually outlined this a little bit um, more clearly on this slide, but Harjo causes milk production um, issues and it may cause mastitis in some animals and not in others. So it's been a very significant thing in the um, dairy industry because they're actually monitoring milk production. I think that's a problem in the beef industry because we don't, it can be um, an insidious um, issue going on where you don't realize that the animals affected by Lepto Harjo, her milk production drops, Calf's not fed as much, it wastes and could potentially die or um, or just be a poor doer. And it's actually all resultant from an infection with lepto uh, rather than her just being a poor mother. With the Pomona, um, it can have more um, significant impact and calves can get this acute septicemia. And basically you, you probably wouldn't even know in our sort of grazing systems um, you'd probably just find them dead or very ill and you know you're sort of wondering what on earth might be going on. In an older animal you can sometimes see anemia and jaundice where I think most people would know that jaundice is that um, you, you go yellow um, and you can see a thing called red water and that's due to the breakdown of the blood cells and so the urine is actually um, quite dark coloured. Often they sort of talk about it being a port wine colour but I think the biggest problem in our sort of areas, we just, these production impacts on cattle, I think they're missed um, by not only producers, but actually probably even to a degree by vets because um, you don't see it, you're not called out for these things. And, and then, you know, we don't put it on our radar all the time, but I think it's probably sitting there quite insidiously or subclinically and we're not always quite aware of it because we're not seeing the animals come in twice a day and checking milk production or noticing the bobby calves near the dairy are sick and things like that. So I think there are a few things that get missed that way, but it's something to have on your radar. So I sort of thought, well, you know, some people say, I'm not gonna vaccinate, it's too expensive. So I actually bothered to, to have a look at how much seven in one vaccine costs. And it's really, 
approximately about two dollars seventy head. Like there'd be variation between suppliers, but that's roughly what it is. And when you look at the value of a cow calf unit at the moment being three and a half to five and a half thousand dollars, depending on breed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when you're looking at just the overall cost in a heifer that's had two shots, that's five dollars forty for the year. That's your maximum. So most of the time, it's only costing you two dollars seventy a year. So you're looking at if if the animal, you know, the cow calf units worth three and a half thousand dollars, it's it's point one five percent of the value of that unit. But if it's worth five and a half thousand dollars, it's point oh nine percent. It's so small, it's just not worth not doing. So I think the biggest take home message around this for cattle producers is vaccinating for lepto and you've got to do it annually to ensure that they're actually covered and making sure those calves get done so they don't uh, fall prey to something like Pomona. The other thing is this indirect impact and that's human health and I just I found this actually through um, it, they call it communicable diseases but um, basically it's a public health unit and you can see there between 2018 and 2021, just the number of cases of lepto. And now 2021 was a huge year with 92 cases. And that was partly also on the back of the um, mouse issue we've been having. And, um, and that's not untypical because mice can also so carry it, but you do not want to be getting um, lepto, but it's something if you're getting fevers and a rash and you're feeling really crook that you should alert your doctor to the fact that it could be left over. Okay, feral impact, a feral pig impact on the sheep industry is more to do with physical things. So lamb losses due to predation, infrastructure damage, pasture damage and competition and fouling of um, water sources. So lamb losses and predation, why on earth would a pig want to eat a lamb? Well, they're monogastric animals like ourselves and they're omnivores and they need to have um, some animal matter in, in their diet and they'll eat up to about 20% of their diet in animal matter and that can be everything from an insect to a lamb like and everything in between. So they do a lot of damage you know, to the natural environment but they'll also um, do quite a bit of damage into, um, you know, into our production systems. And so, Looking at lamb losses from a few different sources, you can sort of see it ranges between 4% and 37%. So, you know, it can be really significant in certain years and not as significant in others. But as Dave alluded to in his um, slide, you know, your losses can be quite significant. And I just sort of did it on a, a rough thing where if you had on today's price, so about $174 the other day, lambs on average, if you only lost four percent of your lambs, um, and you had a hundred, you know, on the average of a hundred lambs, you, you're dropping about um, six hundred ninety-six dollars. But if you had lost thirty-seven of your hundred lambs, you're up around, you know, five thousand dollars. So it's pretty significant. The other thing is that direct competition for pasture and supplementary feed, um, which you'd all know actually does happen. I think Dave alluded to it, and you know. It was um, quite clear what they sort of do on that front, but also this fouling of water sources and either bogging up the edges of dams and creeks and things, or actually just getting in the troughs and, and they foul the water up and sheep aren't really good with um, dirty water. And in the summertime, that's a, a major thing because I've got to um, be drinking. The other thing is this infrastructure damage and it sort of seems ridiculous to some degree, but when you get that fence damage, the big thing I think that people um, have issues with is rams wandering, whether they're rams from somewhere else or in your own place, but that increases your risk to Brucella ovus um, and, and also just misjoining. So you end up with, you know, joining out of season and things, but um, B ovus is a big problem with production in sheep actually. And, and that sort of uh, low level, um, like um, animals not getting into, um, into lamb. The other big one is Brucella suis, and its importance is really around human health and canine health. It doesn't affect our um, cattle and sheep directly at all, um, but it is a big thing in human and canine health. So, B. suis uh, 
has been in Australia to some degree for many years. And I'll just put there that it was first detected in domestic pigs in 1936, but there was a massive eradication program and they got rid of out of the domestic um, um, pig industry in 1968. But it reared its head in feral pigs in the 70s. And there's sort of been studies on and off just trying to look to see where it is. And even in 2008, nothing had sort of been detected down in New South Wales, but by the mid, you know, sort of 2010s, we were starting to see um, positives in feral pig samples. And that was really on the back of detection in, um, in domestic dogs, which was actually very interestingly diagnosed by a private vet in Inverell. Um, and, and she had a dog that came in with swollen testicles and she is originally from Germany where they have problems with it a bit and it just twigged and that sort of set the, the um, wheels in motion on this. Clinical signs in dogs can be really variable. Everything from one swollen testicle to two swollen testicle, um, testicles, abortion, um, lameness, uh, just off colour, but the distribution of cases are really mainly southwest Queensland, northwest and central west New South Wales. And the biggest risk factors are, of course, pig hunting or feeding feral pig meat. Um, so it's one of those things that I think we should be aware of. I just thought this was a bit interesting because I hope it's clear enough for people, but it just shows feral pig density and, and then over the top of that um, case numbers. And you can sort of see, unfortunately, in the Northwest, we're definitely the ones with uh, with the cases. So we're sort of getting up into that 11 to 22 cases in that study from 2011 to 2015. And we've got high density um, number of feral pigs. And then very recently, um, one of the vets at Gundawindi has been doing research on um, the zero status, which is basically um, evidence in the blood that the, the dog has been exposed to um, brucella suis. And as you can see again, Northwest New South Wales and Gundy are the big ones. So there ended up being, um, I think it was from like 300 and something dogs. There was about um, 21 dogs that ended up being um, positive. And that sort of ends up being around that 6% of dogs presented um, more positive with it, which is significant. Um, and then, of course, humans can get it too, and you can get, either get it directly from the pigs or you can get it actually from, from a dog. So it's not common, but it's you've got to have it on your radar, I think, if you're dealing with feral pigs. Other issues, and they're not really, um, this melodosis is very rare, but there is the odd case that's been down into southwest Queensland, so there's always that potential for us. And it's more to do with abscesses in sheep. But the other big thing is um, feral pigs um, being a reservoir and also um, moving uh, any of these exotic or notifiable diseases in Australia if we got them. So I think we all have a bit of a, uh, a role to play in ensuring that we're keeping on top of them. And so I suppose my take home points were really that you've got to think there's direct and indirect economic impact. So it's not just directly on your stock, but there's those indirect impacts on your own health or work dogs. Cattle, just vaccinate them for leptospirosis. It's, it's cheap um, in comparison to actually um, not doing it. And when you just look at the value of your um, cattle at the moment, I think it's really worthwhile. Sheep, you do, all you can do is good feral pig control and possibly exclusion fencing, but that's expensive, but you know it's an option for some people. Your dogs, just don't feed them feral pig meat. And if they are crook and off colour, go and get veterinary help. They can be treated, but you're better off getting them treated early. And for yourself, just instill good hygiene. Wash your hands, wear gloves if you're going pig chasing. Um, yeah, just be very mindful that you too can get it. So I hope um, that was informative for people and I haven't checked to see if there are any questions, but hopefully that was all right. <laughs> I, I haven't seen any questions on there yet, Justine. So if anyone is thinking about questions, just in that chat box is where we need them. So um, 
by all means go ahead and, and put some stuff in there and we can uh, answer them as we go. Um, well, thank you very much, Justine. That was great. Um, I'll, um, I'll just change over now and I'll bring Emma in. Thanks, Dave and Justine. Um, re re really informative um, presentations there. Um, so I'm presenting um, today on behalf of um, myself and Peter West. Um, unfortunately, Peter couldn't be um, with us online this afternoon. Um, so uh, my presentation's on the feral pig scan resource. And just going back to Dave's um, talk, he fulfilled, uh, he was talking about um, the need to be vigilant and to be monitoring um, feral pigs at the moment because it's a prime season. And I suppose the feral pig scan resource really fills that um, that niche, that gap. Um, so it's a it's a free community resource, um, and it's funded through the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, um, as well as some other groups and organisations such as Australian Wood uh, Wool um, Innovations and um, local land services. So what is feral pig scan? Uh, it, it's part of the feral scan resource, um, and feral scan consists of multiple different um, species platforms. Um, but in the case of today, we're, we're looking at um, feral pigs. Uh, it exists as a website and a um, mobile app, uh, which can be used in field. Um, and that app can be downloaded for both Apple and Android devices. So what do people use feral pig scan for? So you can monitor uh, for pests. So you can look at um, which where pests are moving to. Have you seen um, feral pigs in um, new localities? Uh, where are feral pig hotspots, etc.? It's a resource for recording and reporting feral pig activity, um, and you can notify your neighbours and um, local land services um, about pet feral pig activity in your local area as well as planning and documenting um, where you're undertaking control. And that might be where you're undertaking control now and in the future, um, and also looking at, um, looking at the history of control and um, using it as a planning tool for, um, for future control. And that includes things like trapping and baiting and perhaps shooting. There's a couple of different information types that you can record in Feral Pig Scan. The first one is sightings and evidence. So if you're driving around your paddocks and you see pigs, uh, perhaps you might just see some feral pig tracks or you might have some wildlife cameras set up and be capturing um, evidence of pigs on um, the cameras. You can record damage or impacts um, and that might be uh, say to fence lines or um, damage to crop or soil. And you can certainly um, record where you're undertaking control. I just wanted to point out that um, we've, we take um, the privacy of your information and the information you enter um, quite seriously. So you have the option of entering sightings and damage records as public or private, but all control records are entered um, privately only. Uh, so that means that only you uh, perhaps some of your group members, if you're part of a group, and local land services. They're the only ones that can see that um, control information. Uh, just a bit of information on how to use a website. This is a home page for Feral Pig Scan. Up the top, um, we've got the login button. Um, you can record information through the website using the map. You can register a profile. We highly recommend that you create a profile. If you need help with this, I um, can offer my assistance. Um, you can certainly download the app off the um, homepage and you can access resources on feral pig management and instructions on how to use the feral pig scan uh, resource. This is an example of the um, feral pig um, uh, data recording form via the map. So up the top, um, I've highlighted here that you can record either sightings, damage or control through the website. 
you simply fill in the form and you click on the map to place a marker pin and that will record your information on the community map, as you can see here. Um, the app's probably the most used um, feature of um, Feral Pig Scan and um, the beauty of it is that you can walk out into your paddock, um, record the information and the app will automatically um, include the date, the time and your GPS location for you. And so once you've got the app downloaded, um, you simply select Feral Pigs, select your um, the type of record that you would like to enter, in this case sightings fill in the form and then click submit. So it's pretty uh, easy for people to use and very simple. Um, just another point on privacy. If you do choose to enter sightings and damage records as public, we have an additional um, Zoom scale privacy setting. So if I'm another member of the community, say for example, I'm a hunter from Sydney um, and I want to jump online and have a look at where feral pigs are being sighted um, in Northwest New South Wales. This is as far down as I can zoom. So you cannot zoom right down and see individual um, properties. You'll only be able to see the generic location of um, feral pigs, which you can uh, see on this map here. So once again, we take privacy really, really seriously through the feral scan and feral pig scan program. Dave was talking about um, people working together and um, forming um, groups and that being part of um, your best practice methods when you try to control feral pigs. In Feral Pig Scan, there's a feature where we can join people into a private group, which means you can communicate between each other. So, um, for example, I could enter uh, sightings or damage of feral pig and that would email uh, both Dave as part of local land services um, and also my neighbours um, would receive an, e an email about that information so it gives them um, access to that, that not only private information but instant information so I get that, um, that information updated regularly. This is an example of a group outline and this is an example of the email that you would receive or that you would send. The blue underline uh, which says click here to view this record on the map. Uh, once you click that in your email browser that will automatically open up the feral pig scan map and you can view where um, that record is located and the details of the record. So just covering some of the benefits, um, you can securely document feral pig problems on your farm. Uh, you can certainly help each other to manage feral pigs in your area. So this provides um, information, communication and a planning tool to help you um, work with your neighbours and um, with other uh, members of your local community uh, when uh, planning and undertaking feral pig management and control. Um, importantly, it does help to keep your neighbours and LLS uh, informed about what's happening in your local area so that you can work together and um, help to uh, and receive or provide support. In addition, um, if you're seeking funding, you need some sort of evidence to be putting in those um, funding applications and FeralScan um, can help to support those applications by providing that map and um, having a, um, a body of information of what's been happening in the local area. So what are you seeing? What's the type of damage that's happening, etc. Um, and this might help you access some of um, the best tools and achieve um, better outcomes in your region. Um, as you're aware, there's um, quite some serious impacts by feral pigs, as we've heard in the last three presentations. So um, really make sure that we're um, recording what's happening um, and uh, trying to work together to, um, to uh, achieve better outcomes. So how can Pete and I help you? Uh, we're constantly on the phone with people on a daily basis, we're emailing people um, and we're really um, no questions um, silly at all. If you need help downloading the app or um, if you want to help setting up or joining a community group, um, if you'd like some resources on how to get started with the Feral Scan resource um, or if you'd just like to be um, linked up with people in your community or perhaps um, where to access practical um, 
uh, practical information such as glove box guide for managing feral pigs, um, please get in contact with us. We're here to help you um, and to support you. There's our email address and um, our phone number and you can also find that information on the Feral Pig Scan um, webpage as well. Thanks very much everyone. Thank you very much, Emma. That was uh, that was great, um, and thanks very much to Justine as well. Um, I haven't seen any questions come through uh, in the chat box, um, so unless anyone has anything to um, to add, um, just quickly put something there. But in the meantime, um, thank you very much for giving up your time. Uh, I hope you're able to gather. A bit of information out of that and something that will help you and your, your enterprise and if you need any more information um, you should all have a copy of this and, and we've all got our contacts on there but um, obviously uh, if you need to talk to Emma about feral scan her information is there you know how to look it up you can contact the local land services any of our officers and um, they will um, put us through to the right person to talk to you if you if you want to do any control or or know some more information. Um, well, that's been just a tick under an hour, so I think that's probably pretty much uh, everything we need anyway. So uh, if there's nothing coming up, which it doesn't seem to be, um, I'll say um, thanks very much, and uh, I think we'll finish it up there. But like I say, any more questions by all means, contact us directly. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.